Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Moshe Hoffman. He is a research scientist at MIT Media Lab and lecturer at Harvard's Department of Economics. And so basically we decided to have a second conversation and this time we're going to focus on topics related to uh, how people do social science, more specifically psychology, and even more specifically, we're going to focus most of our conversation on social psychology and its methodologies uh, and how people explain social phenomena in social psychology and things like that. So, Dr. Hoffman, thank you a lot for taking the time again to come on the show. My pleasure. Okay, great. So, uh, I mean, I guess that I've also invited you for the second conversation because I read some of your threads on Twitter. They are very interesting, and there were three or four of them where you talk uh, where you talked about uh, problems with theories in psychology, and you focused quite a lot on some issues in social psychology and then recently also Lee Jessim and others published a paper referring precisely to problems uh, about how people approach um, methods in social psychology and also how they interpret the results and provide explanations for the phenomena that they study. So, I mean, Basically, I guess that we could start with this. Uh, how do you think would be the best way for us to approach uh, social phenomena and to do good social science? Yeah. Um, uh, so, so I guess a, a few things to start with. One is uh, most of what I said that, that was critical on those threads isn't, isn't unique to me. I guess most people who are trained in evolutionary thinking have had very similar thoughts, and I was just trying to kind of sure. spell that examples. Um, uh, 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 also, um, uh, you know, the, the criticism was focused on social psychology largely because I, I know more of that field and, and I was basing it uh, largely on this paper that you mentioned by, by Lee Jassim, um, who, who came up with nice examples from that field. Uh, but, but, but I don't think the, the criticism is unique to social psychology. Uh, um, in, in fact, Almost all of the social sciences, with arguably the exception of, of, of mainstream economics and evolutionary uh, uh, approaches, tends to tends to have very similar problems. Um, uh, and um, so, I'll spell out what those problems are in a, in a second, or maybe you have questions that that, that can lead us. But uh, um, important to, to maybe also mention that, that even if we're going to be critical, the, the field does have a, a lot of value, and I, I hope I, I also got that. In the, these Twitter threads, I, I mean, the reason why I know so much social psychology was because it was worth learning. Uh, um, they they do do a very good job documenting interesting phenomena and, and well controlled experiments that, that that are often quite clever. Um, oh, oh, so okay, so uh, let me just ask you this right away: the, uh, is your criticism focused? Uh, particularly or specifically on what exactly is it about yeah. uh, is it focused more uh, on how people do things in the field or yeah. is it focused more on how people explain the phenomena the useful yeah. phenomena that they study yeah yeah um well i guess they're, they're, they're related and uh, in a nutshell the problem uh, it seems to be that that social psychologists aren't uh, thinking in an ultimate way. They're not thinking, where does our psychology come from? They're not thinking, why does our psychology have all the weird features it does? Why do we feel and think the way we do? They're, they're thinking in terms of, oh, this is like a, a, an interesting feeling that we have. And then they document that. And then they, they kind of, uh, you know, make fun of it or, 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 or describe it as something strange, but without kind of an understanding of where it's coming from. And, and I think that the lack of understanding of where it's coming from is, is the fundamental crux of, of the problem that, that I and others from, who are used to a more evolutionary approach kind of, kind of spot as an issue. And I think that that leads to problems with how they explain their phenomena and, and problems with how they interpret their phenomena. 
questions. Oh, okay, so I, I think that this will be useful. So when you refer to the problem that they have when they don't care that much about explaining the ultimate side of things, are you referring to that dichotomy that people also talk a lot about in evolutionary psychology, that is the proximate versus the ultimate explanation yeah. for a specific mental or cognitive mechanism? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, with the caveat that often, you know, people people talk about that as if they're just two levels of analysis mm -hmm. that can be, be, be separated. And, and, and I think that that's, that's not quite true, that, that if, you, if you kind of ignore the ultimate level of analysis of, of where does this psychology come from, um, it, it's, it's not just like a division of labor or oh, somebody else can handle that. It, it, it can lead to like huge problems in interpretation and, 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 and can be quite misleading and I think often is in the way that, that social psychologists uh, interpret the results. So, so maybe to be, be more concrete, that often when you leave out the ultimate explanation, there's, there's often an implicit one. Um, uh, uh, and I think often social psychologists have implicitly in mind that the psychology works this way because of some kind of like mental um, deficiency, that there's some kind of cognitive constraint, so something that's causing us to work in a funny way, and maybe like if we if we work at it, we can hack our brains, or we can overcome these biases, or we can we can fool ourselves, and we can make ourselves happier by, by using these clever tricks. And that's kind of that is an ultimate explanation. It's just one that's not really spelled out. It's one that's not really li like uh, um, uh, uh, thought through. And, and I think that's where a lot of the issues come from. Like, like if they did take seriously, oh, not just do we need to document the phenomena, but when we spell out the ultimate explanation, we can't just leave it implicit or hint at it in an introduction or a conclusion. We need to treat it as a scientific claim because it might be wrong and because the evidence might might, might point against it, which, which I think often it does. So often because this stuff is relegated to like a quip in the conclusion or, or, or just like an implicit statement in the abstract, it's not treated scientifically and it's not it's not checked in the same way that, that it should be just like the, the, the phenomena that's being documented. So, do you think that for this conversation it could be useful for us to talk a little bit about that uh, that approach that Nico Timbergen came up with that is answering the four questions about uh, how a specific cognitive mechanism evolved and how it operates? Because I guess that those are very uh, four very interesting questions because, I mean, he was talking about the proximate explanation and the ultimate explanation explanation and for each of them he had two questions so for the ultimate side of things he said that it was important to understand the um, uh, the phylogenetic origin of the mechanism that is where it came from from an evolutionary perspective its evolutionary history in other species and ours uh, and also to understand the function of the mechanism that is the specific uh, evolutionarily relevant problem that it had evolved to solve and then on the proximate side of things he talked about understanding how the mechanism itself worked that is the kinds of stimuli for example that it processed how it did so the types of uh, outputs that it gave when exposed to different types of stimuli and also the developmental side of things that is uh, studying how the cognitive mechanism develops over the lifetime of the individual or at least during its developmental period. So do, do you think that that could give us a good framework to approach these kinds of questions, having these four questions to answer and thinking about uh, different levels of analysis? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Tim Bergen w w was right to point out that there are different levels of analysis. It's not so obvious to me that the same four are the relevant ones that we should care about for human psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess you know that, that's not particularly pertinent to this conversation. I guess we can talk about that. But 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 it seems like uh, m most relevant is like the ultimate versus like the other three. Um, because the, the ultimate is, I think, what the, the behavioral scientists are all, and social psychologists are often missing or leaving them. And, and therefore, I would argue implicitly getting wrong. Um, but 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 I, I do like the point that that uh, uh, there are different levels of analysis. But maybe maybe to, to clarify the issue a little bit, let, let me give a, 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 
an example from biology where, where you know biologists don't make this mistake. They understand that there are these convergence for, for levels, and, and they analyze it at different levels. Uh, you know, some 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 biologists really just care about the the neural substrate or or, 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 or the biochemistry, and others care about the evolutionary explanations, and that's fine. They they don't think of it a, a, as an issue, but they also because they're aware at least of the ultimate level of analysis, because they're, they're trained in how to think about this, because they treat that as part of the scientific endeavor, they don't end up giving really uh, confused uh, um, uh, explanations for, for the different levels. So, so an example of this would be if you read a biology paper, which you never would, but but, but imagine you do it, and, and, and it would say, um, you know, the reason why peahens are attracted to peacocks with long tails is because they find them sexy, or, or it turns them on, or, 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 or um, they're pleasant to look at, or something like this. Like, you know, any any biologist, you know, would consider that paper ridiculous. And if you read that paper, which you never would, because no, no such paper would ever be written, uh, you would immediately say, like, like, what the hell? This isn't adding any insight whatsoever. Um, and, and and you're right that biologists don't always answer the ultimate question, but that's because the ultimate question is often obvious or well known or or, 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 or or somewhat separable. But like, but like they also don't give silly explanations because they haven't thought about the ultimate. And it would be quite silly to like answer why do peacocks have long tails by recourse to peahen uh, like like preferences. We all know peahens are attracted to that. The question is why. Uh, um, and and for, uh, yeah. So so uh, whereas you know. Con Compare that to social psychology, where you get explanations in terms of oh, because it makes us happy all the time, or it feels good all the time, and like you know, you immediately realize the biology that that, that wouldn't fly. Why does it? Why does it fly here? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I mean, but uh, then the problem here is really not how people in social psychology approach approach the study of uh, the. Um, the mechanisms, the mental mechanisms that they study, particularly in the social environment, because those are basically the mechanisms that they study. I mean, things that operate in our mind when we're dealing with other people or interacting with them or thinking about our position in the social environment and so on and so forth. But I, I mean, is it the case then that you're saying that the issue is not really with how they study the mechanisms themselves, but the explanations they come up with to why the mechanisms work as yeah. they work. Yeah, 100%. I, I think social psychology is a very valuable uh, uh, scientific field when it's documenting phenomena. Once they start talking about explanations, they, they, they don't apply their scientific tools to it anymore. They, they're, not, they're not rigorous in, in treating them as like, does this make a priori sense? Does this fit the evidence? Have we experimentally validated this? They, they kind of leave that outside of the scientific approach, and, and it's just part of part of the spin. And, and that's what you often see. And, and, and one of the things I, I, I touched on a lot in this thread is that uh, for some reason, the, the peer review process and the training process in social psychology is extremely rigorous uh, on the dimension of does the experiment uh, have internal validity? Does the experiment actually docu document the phenomena you're, you're, you're claiming it does? And that, the answer is very much so. Like, like social psychology does a great job at that. And, and they, they, they treat that very rigorously. But then when it comes to how it gets explained, the scientific method is completely out the window. And, and, and then, then it's just, you know, complete spin. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the things that I touched upon in that thread is that that Complete spin fits our intuition often, it's often easy to sell, it often sounds sounds quite sexy or sounds quite useful, but like, but that's not science. Um, and, and, and so, so I do think, uh, you know, the field is, is very scientific when it comes to their experiments, not at all scientific when, when it comes to their explanation, and, 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 you know, that makes them less valuable than they could otherwise be. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's mostly an issue about how people approach the results that they get, how they interpret them, and then also the explanations they come up with for the phenomena, right? Because, for example, I remember, and since at the beginning we were talking about Lee Jessim and this paper, that he, he, has, he and other people have been reviewing a lot of literature on social psychology, particularly about phenomena like stereotypes, and self-fulfilling prophecies, uh, and also more recently 
the literature on implicit bias and implicit bias training and things like that. And it seems to me that most of the time, at least, it's not that the studies or the literature people rely on uh, are poorly designed. It's just that when you go back and look at them and the conclusions they extracted from those data, I mean, they just don't follow up because sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's an issue about the sample size, but other times it's an issue about the effect size. I mean, people see a small effect size and then they exaggerate in the conclusion or something like that. And and, and in terms of the implicit bias, for example, the implicit bias literature, it's very interesting because, I mean, uh, now there are several social psychologists that are even questioning the literature itself and asking really if implicit bias even exists because, I mean, it's a complete mess and even when people do implicit bias training and things like that, it doesn't uh, express in any ways, at least over the medium to long term at the level of their behavior and things like that. Mm. Yeah, I, I think when, when you... Uh, lack uh, a, a, a solid understanding of, of how to explain your phenomena when you lack a, a, an ultimate level analysis you're, you're liable to not have any clue what the boundary conditions are you're liable to not know what the actual moderators are um, and, and you won't really know when something will replicate when when something will apply when it's good advice um, those are all, all problems that I think come with the territory of lacking a good solid theoretical foundation and, and of not having uh, proper peer review for, for, for that part of the, the paper. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and basically when you were referring to the fact that people try to explain phenomena uh, coming up with intuitive explanations, uh, what do you mean by intuitive explanations in that case? Well, you know, go back to my peacock example. To, to, to the peahen, it's very intuitive that the peacock is, is good looking. Um, you know, that, that, that's an explanation in terms of uh, the, the intuition that a peahen would have. Um, likewise, for us, you know, cognitive dissonance, uh, you know, it feels dissonant to have beliefs and behaviors that, that, that conflict with each other. That, that's a fairly intuitive uh, thought. It's just a, a description of the intuitions that we have, which is, which is fine, except as scientists, we're not supposed to just, like, write down our intuitions. We're supposed to understand them and understand how they work and where they come from. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, it's a bad idea to, to just stop at, at, at what sounds intuitive. And unfortunately, the way that social psychology has worked is that uh, those uh, um, uh, in, in, intuitive sounding explanations are exactly the ones that sell. Um, they're exactly the ones that, you know, the undergrads can understand or the New York Times can understand. And, and there isn't any training to go further than that. There's no training to make it more rigorous or make it more uh, a priori plausible or to, to fit it onto something uh, theoretically uh, solid. Um, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I guess that it's not always the case. I mean, many times it is, but it's not always the case that the explanations people in even in psychology in general come up with uh, are really that intuitive for the public in general because for example uh, there are several uh, very messy hypotheses or theories in psychoanalysis that i mean they they don't seem to be to me to be intuitive at all at least for common people or people that are not exposed to that sort of literature but even so when it comes to academics and intellectuals yeah. i guess that they feel very attracted by them in for yeah. some reason well I, yeah i, I guess uh, i'm specifically referring to, to, to uh, the tradition in social psych uh, I, uh, but I, I agree with you, psychoanalysis is a, is, is a different bag, bag of worms, uh, can of worms. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I, I guess, like, like, the issue there is, like, it's, um, I agree, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same, same, same issue of, like, just saying things that are intuitive, like, I guess, a lot of the other humanities. It, 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 it's, well, it's less scientific in totally different ways, and it's got its own set of problems. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm picking on uh, social psychology, but, but I agree that every other field... 
uh, you know, including, uh, you know, economics or evolution or psychology has their problems and, and I'm happy to discuss with you in other threads, but, uh, or in, in other uh, conversations. But, but yeah, I, I do think that this is somewhat unique to social psychology and, and I don't know enough about the history of the field, but I imagine that a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's like meant to be a very popular field. It's meant to be, you know, it's an intro class that every psych student, in fact, in many schools, every student takes. Uh, you know, it gets into, into the popular press all the time. The New York Times has like an editorial every week that's basically a social psych article. Uh, um, and, and, and so it's, it's quite it's quite popular, which kind of requires that you're able to explain things in a way that like everybody can understand without any like 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 background. Uh, um, and it, it's got to sound sexy. And, and, and I guess that there's like something interesting about the, 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 the sex appeal. It's like a mixture of like things that intuitively sound plausible, but also, like I stated, in a way that's like uh, kind of shocking the extent to which it like it surprises or how much it can explain or how important it is. So, you know, take the, the implicit uh, biases that you described, like, you know, um, it's intuitive that like we, we have implicit uh, uh, beliefs and we, we all kind of, uh, you know, uh, we all know that like we often don't admit our true feelings or we have feelings that we, we, we don't admit to and, and, and that you know, there, there's things that drive us or, 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 or statistics that we recognize, which we don't necessarily uh, aren't constantly consciously thinking about. We all intuit that that's going on. Um, we, uh, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, uh, the extent to which the implicit association test can show huge effects on this or can show it in everybody or, or in places where we wouldn't expect it. Um, and and. It, can make it sexy and that now it's talking about, you know, racial prejudices. It's, you know, it's the solution to, to our racial problems, perhaps. It's, um, you know, it can be used, uh, you know, to retrain your employees and stuff like that, that takes something that's kind of intuitive, but that makes it sound much grander and more sexy than it actually is. And, and I think that that's part of the, the secret recipe and part of the recipe that leads to problems is, is that, you know, they take something intuitive, they document it very cleanly, but then in the intro or conclusion or in the, the New York Times op-ed, they extrapolate it to, 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 the, to the biggest extent plausible. Uh, and and that, that, that's where, uh, you know, it has problems, um, you know, uh, replicating or actually, actually fitting with that show. Yeah, I was just wondering if some of it might be explained when it comes to social psychology by the fact that since its very beginning, I guess, or at least since it went popular back, uh, I guess, in the 50s or 60s or something like that, and when people did those experiments like the Ash conformity experiment and then the Milgram experiments and even uh, the prison experiment by Zimbardo and things things like that. I guess that it is, it, it, since its very beginning or since it was, uh, it became a field itself that it has been very politicized. And I mean, it has been very worthy, worried with the sort of worries uh, that we usually associate with people on the left or liberals and social issues that those kinds of people are worried about. And I, I was just wondering if, for example, in this case, uh, game theory and incentives and social dynamics and things like that could help us understand a little bit better how an entire uh, scientific branch, let's say, could go down that route. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I guess the only uh, um, thing I would add is, uh, is that it's not at all obvious what causes science to work, and like there are institutions that, that cause science to often figure things out quite effectively. Um, and it's not yet, it's not so obvious to me what does that, what works and what doesn't, but, but it does seem like, like somehow um, there, there, there are incentives to document things cleanly in social psychology and incentives to think very cleanly about, about um, uh, uh, internal validity and things like that. But then, as I mentioned earlier, there's not such strong incentives to be so clean in how you interpret results or explain them in the intro and conclusion. And, and so, so given that, given that there's no incentive to, to kind of be super scientific in those parts of the paper, then the question is, okay, what, what incentives are going to shape what gets written there? Um, and, and, um, uh, and then, of course, we might want to ask, but I, I have less insight on this, how to extend the incentives from the 
from the body of the paper, from the experimental design and results section, to also apply to the interim conclusion. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, how to get that part of the paper to be scientifically valid, too. But, but anyhow, g given that the incentives are right in the body, but, but not so good in the interim conclusion, what incentives are going to be at play? One, like you mentioned, is, is going to be that there's going to be uh, political motives. So, so um, it could be that the people who are writing the paper or the target audience or, or, or the community you're trying to affiliate with has, has uh, uh, political uh, um, affiliations and, and you want to show allegiance to those affiliations uh, and, and you want to give them give them talking points uh, or, 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 um, or, or a way to, to, to justify uh, um, certain policies and, and, and you can use the interim conclusion to, to spin the, the, the body of the paper in favor of your, your political view and, and, and I think that, that that does to some extent happen and, and, and that is going to uh, um, uh, motivate certain research and, and, and bias certain interpretations and I agree that that goes on. I don't think that that's the, the only bias at play and I, I'm not convinced it's the most important one. Um, my sense is it's just one of the ones that come into play when you don't have a huge incentive for, for the scientific component is, is then other things like politics come in. Um, uh, another important motive is going to be just the one to make your research sound much more interesting or important than it actually is. Um, so, so you're going to you're going to vastly overinterpret the, the the significant of your the significance of your results. Uh, you know how much it like overrides everything we thought about humanity. How much it could explain all of like political behavior. How much uh, um, it disproves all of economics and and, and uh, how much it's a novel theory. Uh, uh, things like that. And so, so I think that that's going to drastically biased the, the interim conclusion uh, as well. Um, and, and I guess those are just two that come to mind, uh, the politics and, and the over, uh, you know, exaggerating the importance of your results. But, but you know, uh, both of which is what you would expect if you're just not constrained by, by the scientific method in, in, in those cases. And, and, and as, as we know, thankfully from the social psych literature, motivated reasoning is very powerful and, and, and people are going to use you know everything they could possibly do to spin the intro and conclusion, and even to internalize. You know, in the way that that fits the politics, or in the way that that makes the their their um, paper or the theory sound more significant than it actually is. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, even even if it's or if it has a big political component to it, at the end of the day, we can further distill it into into social incent incentives in the for in the form of uh, for example uh, ge getting more money or furthering your career or increasing your social reputation or status and yeah. and things like that right sure uh huh um, and, and I guess maybe one other thing to add to that list is is many many people get get a lot of social rewards from being part of a of a movement from being from being uh, a, 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 an activist or, or, or from 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 doing good or, or contributing to a public good and that public good uh, could be uh, you know furthering the liberal uh, cause um, and, and to the extent that you can tie in your research to that, that that's obviously gonna gonna give you um, uh, give you give you so, social rewards and. and uh, which isn't isn't necessarily a bad thing, but 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 it could be bad if, if you're not so constrained by being scientific, then you might be o over motivated to, 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 to do that more than the science uh, can justify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe let's go through a couple of examples of phenomena that people study in social psychology, because maybe it will get more concrete even for people that will be listening and watching this. Uh, and uh, in one of your threads, you talk about uh, three or four different phenomena, the first of which is cognitive dissonance. And I mean, you, you talk about the usual explanation that people give for cognitive dissonance, and then you explain why it's wrong or why it's probably wrong, and then what would be the correct explanation for it. Could, could you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, okay, good. So, so uh, just to briefly summarize, I guess you're, you're referring to there's two different threads that I have. One of them kind of talks through several uh, several prominent theories in social psychology: cognitive dissonance, motivated reasoning, um, the way that they view empathy and altruism, uh, and in-group, out-group stuff. And, and it, it kind of goes through these and talks about kind of the, the explanation social psych gives, the extent to which it's true, but then, but then the thing that it's, it's getting very wrong. Uh, and, and, and the reason why their theories kind of aren't all that deep. 
Um, and that's what I did in that thread. And then the other thread that I have uh, uh, talks about how social psychology, um, the body of the papers are often quite good, but then the intro conclusion have this problem that we were discussing earlier, uh, and talks about like the role of like incentives and motivated reasoning uh, there, and gives some examples uh, largely taken from Lee Justin's paper. Um, so those are the two different threads. And, and so I guess we're transitioning to the first one now. Um, and, and you just want to hear uh, hear about um, uh, the, um, uh, the cognitive dissonance. And um, I guess the, the story that I spelled out there is that, that like it is quite intuitively true that we feel dissonant when we have beliefs that are um, uh, in, in contradiction with each other or beliefs that, that contradict our behavior. Um, and, and that's that's intuitively exactly what, what's going on and that's intuitively, uh, um, I guess, an interesting thing that might have a lot of relation to, to um, how, how we change our beliefs or how we adjust our behavior. And social psychologists have done a great job documenting this. So they have these nice experiments where like, you know, if they pay you to give a speech, um, you know, in favor of, uh, it was communism back in the day. Now, I, I don't know, it might be in favor of the NRA or, or gun rights or something. Um, and, and they find that after they pay you, um, uh, um, they, uh, your, your beliefs on that topic might shift towards what, what you were paid to say. Um, and that's kind of like, like this classic result, which shows like, like, look, even though it was like artificially induced that you would say this, after you've said it, you kind of feel like this uh, internal conflict of, between like your, your beliefs and, and, and your behavior, in this case, your, 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 your um, public sta statements. And, and, and so, so uh, you know, you, you, one way to handle that conflict is to adjust your beliefs. And so that's kind of the story that they give and, and the nice type of evidence that they, they present. And then I guess the criticism that, that, that I presented was, look, um, this is this is a, a very intuitive story, um, but but that's not how theory works. Theory like doesn't just stop at an intuitive story. You have to explain why our psychology works this way, and by doing so, you'll gain a better understanding for what the actual phenomena is and for when it occurs. And, and, and so let me let me walk through through some of the issues with, with the story and, and what they're missing uh, by it. Um, so so for one, it, it's it's not true that. Um, uh, that there's an inconsistency between our, our, our beliefs and our, our behavior. So, so they're actually like misdiagnosed what's going on in this experiment. So, so in particular, like your belief is communism is bad. Your behavior is uh, um, for uh, a dollar you are willing to say communism is good. Um, there's there's zero logically inconsistent here. Like it's perfectly consistent to be willing to lie for a dollar and be willing to like. Uh, and communism be wrong. Those are two like facts about the universe that are both true and, and both consistent. Um, and so, so it's not that the dis cognitive dissonance, the feeling that causes you to adjust your belief, is being caused by a logical inconsistency. It's being caused by by, by something else. Okay. And so when when they, when they say there's logical inconsistency that drives us, they're actually getting it quite wrong. And now, if we think about like what could actually be driving this at, at like an ultimate level, well, well, you might actually be able to to, to better figure out what's going on. And, and so here's, I think, the one that comes from like thinking through the social incentives, um, uh, which is uh, often like the ultimate perspective that I take in my research. The social incentive at play here is, it, it is in general, not in the lab experiment that they're studying, but in general. And then, then once you're used to thinking about ultimate, you realize that it sometimes spills over into lab experiments, sometimes gets internalized into our psychology, doesn't work perfectly in every instance. But, but you have to ask, like, what's the general thing that this is coming from? Where, where, where was it designed? Where did it evolve or get learned? And so in general, the social incentives that might be shaping our beliefs, uh, uh, in particular, you know, this, this notion of, like, not wanting to have inconsistency is, uh, well, you want to have... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, you, you don't want to be, be, be uh, uh, admit to being a, a liar and being able to be bribed for like a dollar to tell a lie. So, so that, that's something that like socially looks quite bad. And like if you have a reputation for doing that, that, that that's really not good. And, and so, so if people know that you said something publicly and that you were you were paid to do it, you you now have a social incentive to uh, adjust your beliefs so that it doesn't look like you were lying and doesn't look like you were bribed. Okay, so the real inconsistency here isn't isn't like one of logic; it's one of like social incentives. Namely, you can't maintain the belief that that communism is evil and present yourself as somebody who doesn't lie and get bribed. So the inconsistency again is not logical; it's between maintaining your reputation of being a non-liar. And, and, and opposing communism, and, and so so now if we have a reputational motive to adjust our beliefs, uh, not like one based on like 
logical consistency, but one based on like the desire to maintain a reputation as, as an honest, trustworthy person. And, and, and so the idea is we, we kind of have uh, developed the psychology that causes us to, to like, you know, when we say things, if we'll, we'll get caught lying, um, if it'll make us look bad, then we should adjust our beliefs and our statements so that it's harder to get caught lying. Okay. And so that's the way that I think of cognitive dissonance, the psychology that like, that like, uh, uh, it feels dissonant inside, but why does it feel di dissonant? Uh, and when does it feel dissonant? It'll feel dissonant when it can like damage your reputation. And, and, and it'll, um, uh, and so that, that kind of explains where it comes from, and it'll tell you a little bit more uh, of when it'll, it'll show up, and it'll tell you a little bit more of uh, how to better characterize it. And, and so, uh, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the story. I can give more examples or evidence if you want. They're also spelled out more in the thread, but I, I think you get the basic story now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean about cognitive dissonance, uh, I mean it, it, it seems to me that yeah, the, that story about people having conflicting beliefs, for example, and then entering into some sort of dissonance and feeling bad about themselves. I mean, it's very intuitive at first sight, but I, I guess that uh, your explanation seems more plausible to me. And not only that, but also, I guess, the fact that it is very frequent that uh, at least I see people having uh, even conflicting beliefs, but because they don't have any sort of uh, uh, they don't bring any sort of damage to their social reputation or something like that, that they don't even uh, care about it or that they don't even notice it. For, uh, so, for example, there are even uh, people uh, that have uh, sort of a dichotomous view about morality. For example, they think that there's one absolute morality for the people that are part of their own group, but uh, at the same time they believe that uh, when it comes to different groups, then it's perfectly plausible that, for example, another society has another type of morality or moral system in place. And so, I, I mean, at the same time, they believe that for their own group, uh, their morality is absolute or something like that. And then, for, uh, and then when they compare to other groups, then morality seems to be relativistic. So, I, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, but I, I like that point a lot. Uh, um, the, the cognitive dissonance story would say, uh, the standard story would say that you feel dissonant for any kind of like uh, inconsistency in your beliefs. And I think you're rightly pointing out that we only feel inconsistent when those, we, we only feel dissonant when those inconsistencies are ones that, that are socially problematic. And, and uh, believing in, in, in both that your morals are true, but also not applying them to other people and not thinking they apply to other people does seem logically inconsistent. It's just one of many that we can offer that, that people aren't at all bothered by. They don't feel dissonant because actually that's socially incentivized. Like, like we have to get along with people from different religions and from different cultures, and we have to believe very strongly about our own morals. And so, so we're actually incentivized to have this inconsistency. You know, uh, another that came to mind while you were telling that, but, but I think we could, we could both give a list of, of, of a thousand, is, you know, um, most people believe religious or theological beliefs are, uh, you know, are, are very easily uh, uh, shown to be ridiculous, and most people who hold them would readily admit that they're ridiculous when, when they're presented the evidence, but then just kind of choose to, like, brush it off. Um, so, so, you know, any, anybody who takes the Bible, uh, you know, literally anybody who's a creationist or a fundamentalist, it, it, won't, it won't take them long to see, like, inconsistencies or, or, or strong evidence against the things that they're claiming. But, but then, you know, the, the next day, you know, completely brush it off and continue with their uh, religious lives as if, as if the evidence isn't there. Um, and, and I think that that's a very, very common phenomenon. And, and you know, the story of cognitive dissonance has a, has a tough time dealing with that unless they recognize, um, like you were saying, I, I think it's a good point, that, that um, uh, sometimes we're, we're actually incentivized to have dissonant beliefs and, and, and then we don't feel the dissonance. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that makes a good bridge to another topic that I had to talk about later on in the interview, but perhaps we could pick it on, uh, pick on it uh, at the moment, right now, that is. So you were, you were sort of referring to the fact that 
uh, I guess that it's not the fact that, uh, for example, in the case with religious people, when they are exposed to facts or evidence of, or some sort of objective information, let's say, uh, that they change their minds. Uh, I, I mean, it's more of the social dynamics that underlie how they think and how they interact with other people that really have more of a, a, deter, a determinant role or play, a, or play a more stronger role in how they deal with information. I mean, and that's why people, for example, scientists and the so-called skeptics and so on, get very easily frustrated when they expose people to facts and evidence and so on, and they don't change their minds at all, or they simply uh, sign all in some way that they have changed their minds, but if you look into how they behave, or, some, or what they say in private or something like that, it's not really the case. So, I mean, when we're talking about those sorts of things about how people deal with information, uh, do you think that it's the case that uh, it makes more sense for us to look into the sorts of dynamics they establish with other people, particularly their in-group, instead of looking at the information they know about. Yeah, and I'm happy to, to send you, uh, uh, presumably you've already read it, but, but uh, there's a third thread uh, that, that talks a lot about this, how, how our, our beliefs are, are not well understood, as at least in certain domains like religious, political, and moral, not well explained by a, a Bayesian perspective of people have their priors and they're updating according to limited information. Um, uh, that story, I think, does really, really poorly uh, when it comes to explaining our moral, religious, and political beliefs. And you, you really have to think of the social incentives at play. And I guess that's what you're getting at. But, but I summarize a lot of these arguments in, in, in that thread, uh, um, so it might be instructive to look at. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I, I would also just uh, say, as I've already kind of alluded to, it's not limited to religion. Uh, religion is, is uh, a very common place where we see, you know, religious people believing things that were that are obviously disproven, like like you know that the world is six thousand years old. Very ridiculous beliefs there. But but in politics, we have people who you know uh, deny climate change, uh, um, or think Trump is a good president. Uh, um, and, and so uh, equally as ridiculous things, but, but in a totally different domain, uh, um, uh, you see that happen a, a, a lot as well. And then, of course, when it comes to morals, like you alluded to before, like we have all sorts of ridiculous beliefs about morality. Um, you know, uh, just the, the, the mere idea that our, that our morals are, are, are in any way true, true and, and that, you know, you could prove it with logic and that you can apply logical rules and get, you know, logical consistency between your morals. Uh, anybody who's done any amount of uh, evolutionary psychology or, or, or actually moral psychology, we know that our morals are very much based on, like, evolved intuitions or, or, or socialized uh, uh, rules uh, uh, that, that in no way can be made logically consistent. And, and so, so we, have, we have all sorts of ridiculous beliefs in all three of these domains. Um, and then the question is, what's the best way to, uh, to understand them? Where do these beliefs come from? How do they work? Um, and, and a prominent theory on the table, um, the, the, the most common approach in, in, in economics is to, is to say, well, people have people have their priors, and then they um, update according to information. And I think there's very good evidence uh, against that story. There's another alternative, which is uh, means, which is a story presented by, by Dawkins, which, which I thought was quite... You know, plausible and, and, and promising when I first read it, but but haven't seen a lot of evidence for for that, and I'm happy to, to discuss that with you if you want. Um, and, and then I, I guess um, another possibility, which we can also uh, debate if you want, is is that this is all there's an evolved psychology of these topics that, that like we evolved to think about about gods in a certain way or about or about uh, um, uh, uh, the climate in a certain way or or, or our in group in a certain way, and that uh, um, that causes us to have all sorts of beliefs in, the, in these three different domains. And, and none of those are, are the approaches. That, that, that I believe in. I, I, I mean, there's some truth to each of them, but 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 for the most part, uh, I, I think if you want to explain like the majority of what's going on in these three domains, you really need to think about the social incentives at play. You you really need to think about um uh, um uh, uh, um uh, things like needing to justify the policies that benefit your coalition, 
the fact that your, your coalition or your in-group can, can enforce norms on you and penalize you for, for, for not acting accordingly and, and for, for, um, for not also spreading propaganda accordingly and for not also internalizing that propaganda uh, accordingly. And so I think that set of incentives, which, which are uh, enforced in our, uh, um, uh, in our everyday lives, has a, a vastly more important influence on shaping our beliefs than, than, than the other stories that, that, that we told, at least in these domains. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, let's speak on that topic, the topic of evolutionary psychology and perhaps where our beliefs come from and how they get transmitted between people and things like that. So, uh, I mean, couldn't it be the case that uh, the specific types of things that we are able to think about w or what is more intuitive for us in terms of uh, thoughts and information that we communicate to one another that uh, that would be best explained I mean the origins of that by an evolutionary approach and evolutionary psychology but then the um, I mean how people establish um, social relationships among them and then the sort of specific types of beliefs that they pick on in certain specific contexts and then disseminate among them, then that would be best understood uh, using a game theoretical approach. I'm, I'm asking you this because, I mean, it still, uh, it still feels a bit weird to me uh, when, for example, you're talking about specific beliefs and why people believe that or belie believe X or believe Y or something like that. And that, uh, because for me, it makes more sense to think about these sorts of issues uh, this way, that is to understand yeah. how our minds evolved and the sort of information they evolved to process and then uh, the the specific content of the beliefs that people transmit among themselves, then that would be where game theory comes in. I'm, but uh, but I mean w uh, to understand where uh, how people process information in their minds and why some sort of uh, some sorts of information. Uh, I mean, they are more sticky, let's say, they, they stick better in people's minds, then we would need an evolutionary approach to that. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think I understand where you're coming from. Uh, um, and I, I think this is a, a, a plausible, a priori reasonable approach. I just happen to think that the evidence suggests that it doesn't do as good of a job for these particular questions. So, so let, let, let me spell out why I believe that. Uh, but I should also mention that now we're touching on a fourth thread. I, 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 I spend a lot of time on Twitter, and I guess you spend a lot of time uh, interacting with me there. Uh, but it might be worth uh, also linking this thread on, on evolutionary side, w w w where I talk about how, uh, I, I guess, the main point in that thread, which I think uh, relates a lot to, to, to the, the discussion we're, we're, we're having or we're about to have, is that uh, I, I think that for some domains, it's true that you really need to think about uh, our, our evolved cognition to understand uh, the weird properties of what's going on in those domains. So if you if you want to understand how, how mating works or how sex differences work, um, it, it, I think it's really, really important to look back at the, the uh, uh, EEA, the, the environment that we evolved in, and, and, and notice what's going on there. And that's going to shape things in our minds that are quite, quite sticky, that are quite you know, um, quite fixed, quite rigid, quite hard to, um, uh, uh, quite not well adapted to our current uh, context. So, for instance, you know, we, we still like having having sex, even when we use protection. And that's really, really hard to explain by, like, the current incentive structure in our environment. I, I, you know, it's not like we currently uh, um, uh, get babies from, from, from having sex. The only possible explanation for why we like it is that we evolved to like it in an environment before condoms, and and, and that preference for for sex, that the, the pleasure that we get from it is, is sticky. It, it's kind of rigid and fixed, and not easily adapted to the current context where where, where um, uh, protection uh, exists. Uh, my claim is that in those domains, evolutionary psych, uh, this approach at looking at like our evolved cognition from uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and the mental modules that might be applied, does a really really good job. 
Um, and so if you want to understand maybe behavior or sex differences, for instance, you really need to look at the evolutionary cycle literature. My, my claim, however, is that morality and religion and politics uh, don't quite work this way. Um, and, and therefore, the approach, uh, not that it's inconsistent with, with you know, biological evolution, of course, humans evolved biologically, but the approach of evolutionary psychology, which is of thinking of, of the environment that we evolved in and mental models that were relevant there, is less useful for these domains. And the reason why I think it's less useful, and, and again, it's not from an a priori argument, because I think a priori it could have been as useful, it, it's from, you know, the place of, of, of empirical observations, which is that our minds seem much, much more elastic in these domains. It seem, they seem much, much less rigid, much, much more sensitive to the current uh, context, and much, much less constrained by uh, the types of things that you describe. And so, so you know, for, for instance, let's take climate denial. Okay, so it could be that we have an evolved cognition that makes it very hard for us to imagine uh, the climate changing, or very hard for us to, 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 to comprehend those relevant statistics, or, 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 or something of that nature. That, that's, that's conceivable, um, and a priori it's plausible that we just have an evolved cognition that makes it hard to think about or, or understand climate change, and that could explain climate denial. Um, uh, I just happen to think that that's not the right explanation for that issue. A better explanation, I think, is that um, big oil doesn't want to have to uh, uh, pay to, to, to reduce the, their carbon emissions or, or, or other pollutants. And uh, one, one way to justify not doing anything is to, is to spread disinformation about lack of climate uh, change and to enforce that on the political party they have control over, which is the GOP, uh, um, and um, to enforce members of this party to, to, to continue to spread this propaganda and, and to internalize it to some extent. And so, so I think you really need to think about the current incentive structure, namely big oil and the control they have over the GOP, in order to understand climate denial. And, and it, it's not so much, you don't really need to think about so much the environment that we evolved in or any kind of mental module. Um, now, now, again, it's not to say that like it's never useful to think about the environment we evolved in or, or, or the mental module. It's just for this particular question, it seems like that gives you less explanatory power than thinking about the contemporary incentive structure. Okay. And, and, and my claim is that that's generally true for a lot of the interesting parts about politics, morality, and religion. Not all. So, you know, go, moving over to, to religion for a moment, um, and I'll give you an example from morality in, in a second. In religion, it's true that, like, you know, there are interesting things about the way that we conceptualize God that kind of require thinking about, like, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, some weird psychology of how we detect agency, let's say. Okay. And, and it's true that like, there are weird things about the way that we imagine God that, that, that have to do with like, an evolved mental module of, of agency detection. Okay. I, I think that those, are, those are nice insights. I just think that those are less, less important, and maybe this is a matter of taste. Like, you, you can't exactly measure like, the degree of things explained. But, but I think a, a much bigger swath of what's interesting about religion are things like what norms get enforced. How does it affect, say, say our sexual behaviors? Um, or or, 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 or um, uh, um, uh, our moral behaviors, and, and I think to understand that it's really not going to be well explained by like these 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 details about how we conceptualize God, and better explained by like the fact that religions consistently um, uh, prevent male male competition and, and uh, uh, induce people to have more kids and to invest in parenting. And one way that they do that is, is by controlling female sexuality. And that's, that's kind of a universal across uh, many, many religions. And, and, and it's very, very powerful and enforcing. It doesn't seem to be part of like a mental module. It seems to be a part of like a, um, a culturally evolved trait um, that's, that's enforced using norm enforcement. And so it seems like if you want to understand that part of, of, of religious behavior, um, which I think is a much more a vaster part than, than, than the details about the way that we conceptualize God, or at least to me a more interesting part, the, the morals that religion enforces. You really need, like, it doesn't help that much to think about uh, an evolved cognitive psychology. So, so again, it kind of depends on the question you're asking, like, is it the way we conceptualize God versus the morals that we, uh, but, but I think for, for at least a lot of the questions related to, to religion, uh, it doesn't help so much to think about the evolved module. So just, to, well, maybe you got the point, if not, I can give examples. Uh, yeah, you got the point. I'll move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was just about to say that I guess that uh, 
even uh, I mean you were referring to some examples that evolutionary psychology by itself explains well enough and I mean we don't need much more to understand how things work like for example the example of sex and condoms and things like that but then when we get into the nitty-gritty of some phenomena like religion then to understand certain specific beliefs and the social dynamics that are brought into place between people in a given society or in, in a given community, then we need other things. I, I, I was just thinking that even in that case of religion and morality and politics and so on, I mean, of course, to understand why that specific society works that way and why people establish, establish relationships with one another that way and even maybe the specific beliefs that they hold we need to understand social dynamics and we need game theory and we need to understand the incentives that are in work there and things like that but I guess that even there uh, I mean, we need to understand why people pay attention to their social environment at all and the specific things that are part of their social environment that they pay attention to. And I guess that that specific bit, uh, I, I mean, we need evolutionary theory and evolutionary psychology to understand uh, how and why we evolved to pay attention to that and the specific uh, aspects and elements of our environment, in this case our social environment, that we pay attention to and that uh, game theory or um, cultural evolution, for example, by itself wouldn't be enough. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and it's good to clarify that. Like when I talk about like the development of contemporary incentives, which is when I, I apply game theory, and, and you might also think about like the cultural evolutionary models or norm enforcement models, I, I, I 100 percent agree that that's meant to be an argument for why that should be added, and why thinking about like an evolved mental module from the EEA doesn't suffice. Um, it's not meant to say that that we should toss evolutionary thinking. Uh, um, uh, and I 100% agree that the main place where evolutionary thinking is going to come into play in these types of arguments is in thinking about um, uh, which types of incentives we will care about. Uh, and, and those are incentives that we evolved to care about that, that uh, tended to relate to fitness in the EEA um, and, and that shaped our learning mechanisms. Uh, um, things like the desire for sex, the desire for power, the desire for prestige, the desire for, for uh, a good reputation or for friends or things like that. Those are all things that presumably mattered a lot in the EA because there they translated into sex. And, and that, that therefore led us to evolve kind of learning modules um, that, that, that um, biased us to develop preferences and beliefs that, that yielded these types of, uh, of rewards. Um, and so 100% so agree, you need evolutionary thinking to understand what counts as an incentive. And I would never, for instance, count as an incentive, it reduces dissonance, um, which is, which if you're not thinking from an evolutionary perspective, you might count that. And you're absolutely right that, 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 that that's not the way that I would do it. And, and I think for good reason that, that, that um, uh, it, it's very valuable to kind of be able to, to, to explain things that are complicated in terms of things that are, are simpler. And the way that, that I do that is, is I explain our complicated beliefs and preferences, not in terms of other beliefs and preferences, but in terms of beliefs and pref uh, in terms of uh, incentives that, that we would have evolved to care about, like the five or six I listed earlier. And so, so that, that, that kind of forces me to be much more parsimonious and also fits, like you're saying, our understanding of, of the evolutionary environment and, and, and incentives we would have evolved to care about. So, so I, I, I think, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess that we need to understand how our brains evolved to process information and the kinds of information we are not only able to process, but the ones we pay more attention to, right? Because, I, I mean, you were talking, for example, about mental modules, and I guess that's a very complicated debate, and people, even in evolutionary psychology, they don't all agree on that topic, I mean, about modularity of the mind, because there, uh, people are, aren't sure if it's all just 
uh, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of uh, domain-specific modules that we evolved, or if there are some domain general models or open-ended models, I mean, uh, cognitive mechanisms that we have evolved uh, to process basically uh, any kind of information that is of the type that the module is able to deal with, but I mean, that is open-ended, that is not specifically about solving a concrete, uh, evolutionarily relevant problem, but we can deal with uh, lots of different types of information. But, uh, but I mean, still, even to understand things like, for example, uh, I guess the principles that we hold, our preferences and things like that. I mean, I, I think that, uh, okay, so the specific things that we prefer, we need something more than evolutionary psychology, of course, and even more so if we are talking about things that, we, that were not present during most of our evolutionary history. But I guess that even then we need to understand uh, the, the underlying cognitive mechanisms that, that allow for us to hold those types of preferences, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair and a priori, it might be, it might be very important. Uh, I, I guess, to me, it's just kind of like a, a, a scientific question of like, how much, how much added uh, insight does that give you? So, so for instance, if we want to understand why people like spices, if they're from, you know, India, like, like, does it, how much insight does it give to, to understand, like, the cognitive representation of, of spice uh, or, or, or the way we process information about, like, different food categories? It, it, it could add information. I have no, uh, 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 add, add insight. I have no a priori reason to think that, 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 that it, it, it wouldn't. It's just a matter of, like, so far, the best papers I've seen on explaining high spice preferences are, are ones that, that completely leave that out. Um, now, now it's true that our brains like necessarily only process some subset of, of, uh, of the information and have to simplify the world. Um, it's just a question of whether or not like adding that to our scientific models is giving going to give us much insight. And I think in some domains it'll give more than others. And and, and at least from what I've seen, if you want to understand, you know, human preferences, at least the ones that are like novel and, and rapidly changing, um, uh, I, I think I think for those, I have yet to see, uh, and I'm open to the possibility. I, I'm not ruling it out. I've heard. I've yet to see good papers that, that show that like understanding the cognitive architecture uh, or, or the information processing really helps us understand these kinds of preferences. Um, and, and yeah, so so it's more just like a how much explanatory power does that way of thinking give you? Um, uh, yeah. but, but, but since you refer to spices, I mean, isn't it the case that, okay, so maybe we can't understand through uh, evolutionary psychology purely, uh, I mean, uh, the, the specific types of spices that people adopted in each region of the globe, for example. But, uh, I, I mean, as far as I know, the literature about spices, isn't it the case that there's at least a big correlation between the use of spices, whatever they are in the different regions of the globe. Uh, th there's a big correlation between that and uh, parasite stress or parasite loads people are exposed to in yep. those regions of the, of the globe. Because I guess that when you look into culinary practices, I guess that most of the the ones that have a lot of spices are more or less distributed yeah. ar around the regions close to the equator. So. Yeah, I 100% I agree, and I, I guess that's what I had in mind, which is like, if you want to understand people's preference for spice, the best way to do that is to understand the, the, the functional benefits of spice, namely that, that it kills parasites, and then, and then to think through like, you know, people people learning their, their, their preferences via, you know, cultural evolution or reinforcement learning type processes. And it doesn't seem, so it seems like that's the framework that's useful for understanding our preferences or spice. It doesn't seem like thinking about information processing or a mental model helps here. Um, now, again, a priori, I, 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 you know, it's not obvious that that would be the case. Um, 
uh, and uh, I'm not close to the possibility that in some other domains that way of thinking is more useful. It's just for this domain, it seems to add less insight. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, earlier you referred to, uh, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that you said at a certain point there that one of the insights that you would consider r relevant from evolutionary psychology and even applying it to game theory and cultural evolution would be uh, the, where the incentives come from and why we pay attention or why we have uh, the specific incentives that we have, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. But let, let me just clarify how that's slightly different from the standard approach in evolutionary psych, okay. which is, uh, which is um, to think about in this particular domain, let's apply evolutionary reasoning to think about like the optimal uh, mental module for, for uh, uh, the optimal way to design a, a brain to solve the, this particular problem if it were to happen in the environment of evolutionary adaptation, uh, adaptiveness. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and I guess like that's different from saying let's use evolutionary thinking to figure out what incentives would matter or what to count as an incentive and then think about what those are in the current context not in the EA, in the current context and think about what kinds of beliefs or preferences that would lead to in this context now there's still evolutionary reasoning going on as you mentioned it tells us what counts as an incentive but then after you figure that out I basically ignore evolution henceforth. I think about, I then apply learning processes and think about the current contemporary environment and forget where these incentives came from. So I forget the fact that the reason we like sex is to reproduce or, or, or to pass on our genes. I forget that the reason why we like prestige or, 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 or a good reputation is because then others are more likely to mate with you or others are more likely, less likely to kill you or, 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 or more likely to partner with you or whatever. And I, I just take these incentives as now, as now those are the fixed things. Those are the primary rewards that we pursue. And then apply them directly to the current context. How do those work in the current context? And, and so it, it, it's a different way of thinking than is done in evolutionary psychology. Um, uh, but, but like you said, it is grounded in, in, in some evolutionary logic, but, but it's being applied in a different way that allows you to get different types of insights. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I guess that the, uh, the real issue here is that we have to approach things in a sort of case-by-case -case basis or uh, um, thinking about specific examples because, for example, as you were talking, one thing that came to my mind was the work by Jer Diamond and how he explained why agriculture developed in certain regions of the globe and not in others and it had had nothing to do with people's intellectual or cognitive abilities, but simply to do uh, it had to do with the fact that they had certain species of animals and plants in that specific geography. But I, I, I guess that uh, even then, I mean, isn't it the case that we have to take into account evolutionary processes at least occurring? at the cultural or even the cultural group level because i guess that so for example let's say that someone in the middle east uh, that there were there was a group of people or a community of people that didn't adopt agriculture or didn't domesticate the animals that were there and that they and that humans were able to domesticate for one reason or the other i mean due to the animal's behavior and something like or something like that but uh, and other groups didn't do so but i mean over time uh, is i mean the ones that adopted agriculture and domesticated the animals would outcompete the others uh, i mean there uh, there are several different possibilities maybe they would go into conflict with one another and then the ones that had the better tools would uh, overcome the others or for example the ones that uh, add agriculture would out reproduce yeah. the other groups and things like that so uh, i mean uh, of course this is not strictly explained 
by evolutionary dynamics occurring at the genetic or biological levels. But I, I mean, we still have to understand how those sorts of things happen and, and not simply, uh, how would I put it, uh, maybe uh, tr trying to uh, uh, process or some sort of game theory dynamics, understanding why people at the present moment in that specific place have uh, these type of, I guess. Yeah, so I, I think I understand your question. And I, I, I think I would just say that, like, a, a priori, kind of like how I said before, on the difference between my approach and the evil psych approach, like, a, a priori, it's not obvious to me if, if Jared Diamond's approach or the cultural group selection approach that you described is going to be more valuable. I, I think it's kind of an empirical uh, question. And, um, you know, I, I haven't followed up so much on, on Jared Diamond's book on, on how much people still believe it or, or, or think there, there was good evidence to support it. Uh, it, it seems conceivable that, that it was the best explanation uh, um, and, and that cultural group selection just doesn't apply that much here. It's also conceivable that, that cultural uh, 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 evolution and cultural group selection would, would be able to explain a, a lot more. And I, I, I think uh, one would have to kind of look at, like, you know, what examples uh, uh, are they able to explain? I, I guess I haven't looked at that particular question, but a priori, I see both as like equally plausible. Uh, um, and, and I guess you know, likewise here for, for like you know, um, I, I think it kind of depends on the question. But but when it comes to like cer a certain set of questions, um, uh, I think that the approach of looking at the contemporary incentives and then applying game theory does really well. And I'm happy to articulate what that set uh, of context happens to be and, and how I know what that set is, you know, um, uh, what kind of, uh, there are certain, I guess, features that I look for that tell me, ah, oh, it's likely to do a good job here, but not there. And so, so I guess maybe just to briefly summarize what that is, um, and I'm somewhat flexible, maybe you'll convince me that, that uh, I'm getting the, the border slightly wrong, but, but I think that the, the various domains in which our psychology uh, our beliefs and our preferences are rather flexible and rather responsive to the current uh, uh, contemporary incentive structure. And, and that's something you could kind of check for. You can ask, like, oh, you know, does our views on, on um, uh, you know, how, uh, uh, who, who deserves to be treated well, is that, is that a view that, like, is kind of fixed and rigid, or is that a view that, like, totally changes depending on the circumstances? And, and it, it looks to me like, well, you know, we saw Nazi Germany, um, you know, we know that, like, in a matter of, of, of years, an entire society can change their views on this. Um, and and so, so, so we know that, that like, it looks like that's really flexible. Uh, and so that tells me, okay, that's probably a context where um, uh, the contemporary uh, uh, environment is going to play a particularly relevant role. Okay, And it looks like a lot of stuff to do with morality, if not everything to do with morality, ha ha has this property. Uh, um, you know, with some some maybe minor edge cases, um, um, like how we treat our kin, that seems to be uh, you know much better explained by evolved psychology. Uh, you know, incest aversion, uh, 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 fine. Um, so so some aspects, not but most of uh, of our morals seem to be very very uh, very much shaped by, by contemporary incentives. In which case, things like game theory and things through the contemporary incentives is going to do a better job than I think many of these other approaches. And a priori, I wouldn't have necessarily known that, but one way that I can tell is you can ask, like, how flexible is it? How responsive is it to incentives? How much can you explain by uh, uh, about morality by looking at individual differences in incentives? Can you predict who's going to have which morals? Can you predict which societies are going to have which morals? But, but, but uh, um, can, can you predict when somebody's morals will change? How well can you predict that stuff based on the incentives? And I think it deserves that. You know, it's an empirical question, but but I think in the domain of morality, I think there's really good evidence that the incentives do well. And so, so I, you know, I tend to apply that approach there. Um, but like we said before, you know, our sexual preference is less so. And so for our sexual preferences, I wouldn't think to apply this approach. I also wouldn't think to apply Jared Diamond's approach. I mean, I, I don't even know how to apply it there. Um, you know, it, yeah. So, so you know, it kind of depends on the domain. And like the ways that I know to, to check for contemporary incentives is to kind of like look for that flexibility and look for the responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that that example of morality is very interesting. And now that you gave the example of how, for example, people in Germany change their moral system, let's say in a very short period of time after the Nazi regime 
uh, went down, let's say. Uh, I, I guess that one thing that came to my mind was, um, I mean, I agree with you, and I guess that there are very specific instances where, for example, uh, just to give an example, in his last book, Enlightenment Now, Steven Pinker talks about, and he already did so in uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, about how our morality uh, as a human species and in most of our human societies has progressed over time since the Enlightenment and since the advent of capitalism and so on. And I mean, it, it strikes me as a very weird argument that he gives when, um, I mean, when he says or when he uses the specific, that kind of wording that he says that morality has progressed because I, I guess that okay he gives all sort all sorts of factors and influences that he thinks might have played a role in the ways by which our moral systems uh, changed over time but I guess that it would be in that case much better explained or understood by applying, uh, game theory and, and even and even more than that it would be uh, uh, easier for us to understand why those changes or how morality changed in a specific direction I mean it's not inevitable and it could it could go back or it could go sideways in the yeah. future by changing uh, the social dynamics and even more so when we have to take into account certain very specific problems that we have nowadays, like, for example, climate change. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so before I start, I just want to say I, I, I'm enjoying this conversation. I like talking to you a lot. I, I, I do have to go in a minute. So maybe after, so after this question, we'll call it off and we can continue on another Skype call if you want at a different time. Um, uh, but... Uh, um, uh, I should also preface by saying I, I, like I presume you, have a lot of respect for, for Steve Pinker and for, for, for many of his ideas uh, um, and enjoy much in Enlightenment Dow and Better Angels. I, I think the empirical data for, for progress is, is very strong uh, and it's very well written and, 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 and very well presented. Um, but, but I, like you, am, am skeptical of, of, of a primary thesis in that book, uh, uh, which is that, that uh, this progress is well explained. I, I, well, I think... The primary explanation, you're right that he mentions a few, especially in Better Angels, but the primary explanation seems to be that that, that we, we figured out the truth, that, that we're kind of like figuring out morality and like that that's just like a, a way in which we're getting enlightened. And he and his uh, wife, have a, uh, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, uh, um, have, a, have a TED Talk where they, where they lay out that explanation. Uh, it's, a, it's a cute animated video that's like, you know, 10 minutes long, uh, uh, recommended. But, but uh, I, I, I think the, the evidence is, is fairly strongly against that explanation. Um, uh, I, I don't think that, that it's, uh, like I said, and I lay out in the study, I don't think that our, our, our moral beliefs come from logic or, or reason or evidence. I think there's a lot of evidence that it doesn't. Uh, um, and, and there's a lot of evidence that, that doesn't explain like, like the, the changes that we saw over time and, and when we um, uh, um, gain certain rights or apply certain rights to certain people. So, so I'm skeptical of that explanation. But, but I, I do think it's a very interesting phenomenon that there is some sense of progress, which I agree with you. It's not clear where that's going to go with Trump taking over. And, and I agree with um, uh, uh, Taleb that, like, you know, you could just have a, 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 a you know, a thick right tail uh, where, where some, some extreme event happens, like Trump destroying democracy and, you know, all of the trends that, that, that Pinker picked up on uh, go to hell. I, I think that, that that's all possible and problematic and climate change is another problematic uh, thing that's coming up. You know, a one nuclear war could also destroy everything. So, so, so we, we don't quite know, but it does look like the, the, there's a, a basic trend towards expanding the, the circle of rights um, and, and to the notion of equality and liberty and that seems to, and reducing violence. And that seems to have been going on for a while. And, and it's an interesting question why. Um, and I think that the incentive story that I often talk about with, with contemporary incentives, I, I think that does a really good job explaining uh, you know, cross-culture variation of morals or, or individuals, why they change the morals or, or, um, uh, um, or, or between person differences within a culture and their morals. I think it has a harder time explaining this particular 
um, phenomena that there's progress over time. I, I think that, that that's kind of puzzling. I don't have a good game theoretic model that explains that. I haven't seen one. Um, I, I don't buy Pinker's story for it, but I don't know what the right story is, and, and I'm certain, certainly open to, 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 to ideas. But, but I, 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 I've yet to see like a good game theoretic explanation, um, and I've yet to be convinced by, well, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have a preferred explanation for it? Uh, uh, do you have something in mind that you think explains it well? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so, but I guess that uh, I also don't agree with Pinker's explanation, at least that bit about his thesis that, uh, I, I mean, and I don't agree in general that uh, reason or what he calls reason or what scientists and skeptics in general call reason that play that big of a role particularly in how people interact with one another and how people establish their social dynamics and things like that. So. Okay, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and like we said, like a priori, it's, it's hard to know what theory is going to add the most insight in a given context. So it would be nice to know what, what theory ends up helping us understand this. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So uh, you have to go. So let's end the interview here. And uh, as we as we said, maybe in the future we could do another one to continue the conversation that we were having here. Great. And I'll I'll send you all my related uh, threads in case people want to see see more of uh, of the arguments that I make. Okay. Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar and PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Santel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Gondriano, Jane Eninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Giddy, Doctors Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingard, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.